Okay, good afternoon. And uh, between September 15th and October 15th, it was uh, Hispanic American Month, and we kind of missed that uh, by a couple days here. Not too far, but uh, I'm going to talk about Hispanic American athletes and people who I knew and how they had to overcome some problems to become honored, like this guy who's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame who I'm speaking to, Tom Flores. Uh, he uh, was uh, with the Oakland Raiders as a coach, the Los Angeles Raiders, also as a player. Uh, also Jim Plunkett, who played for him. His parents were blind. He became a star and his parents were blind. Uh, Tom Fears. Tom Fears was a great player whose uh, one of his parents was Mexican. Uh, Pele, who uh, was a great, great star and apparently a major duty partier as well. Uh, a lot of partying in his life. Uh, Lionel Messi is now the guy around uh, soccer now, uh, now playing in the United States, but the best player of his era. Uh, Roberto Clemente who was killed on a humanitarian mission after an earthquake in Nicaragua. He's also in the U.S. Marines Hall of Fame. Uh, Jose Altuve was one of the best players of his era. Uh, little guy as well with the Houston Astros. Now, Fidel Castro, was he or was he not a good baseball prospect? and would have history been changed if he signed the contract with the Washington Senators. Uh, one day I told my wife, I have a friend named Jose Valdivisto, uh, Jose Valdivisto and uh, Jose was working at Channel 47 WNJU in New York, and uh, I said, where are the parties? So whatever you do, don't mention Castro. She did. <laughs> I'll tell you about that. Uh, he just passed away the other day, Fernando uh, Valenzuela, who uh, was a hero uh, in Los Angeles to the uh, Mexican community there. Uh, Hispanic sports stars included the boxers, Julio Cesar Chavez, and uh, the tennis player, Guimeno Villas, uh, and uh, Marina Buno, who was a great tennis player that nobody seems to remember of the 1950s and 60s. And the Mary Mex, Lee Trevino, uh, who was a golfer, and Nancy Lopez, who was one of the greatest first-year golfers in the history of the Ladies Professional Golf Association. Carmelo Anthony, basketball player, and Kyle Gasal, also a basketball player. Rebecca Lobo, who uh, was a great college basketball player. Dana Torres, um, who was a great swimmer in the Olympics and Austin Matthews, who plays hockey with the Toronto Maple Leafs, and Scott Gomez, who's actually on the soap opera, Days of Our Lives, as a, as a one-time character while he played with the New Jersey Devils. But getting back to this guy, Tom Flores, I happen to know Tom, and um, as you saw in the picture from 1997, where I was interviewing, and uh, I used to see Tom an awful lot, uh, he was a quarterback, um, probably should never have been a pro quarterback, but he ended up being a pro quarterback, and he's in the uh, Football Hall of Fame. Uh, in 2021, he was finally elected to the Hall of Fame. He won championships as a player, and as a coach, he was also one of the first Latinos who was ever running a team, the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, 1960, the first year of the American Football League, he became the first Latino starting quarterback in professional football, started 13 games with the Oakland Raiders, also played for Buffalo and with Kansas City. He was an assistant coach with the Oakland Raiders for seven seasons before being named the uh, head coach in 1979. He would guide Oakland to a title in his second year as the coach in 1980, 27-10 victory over Philadelphia in Super Bowl XV. His Raiders became the first wild card team, team never to finish first, to win the Super Bowl. His second Super Bowl was as a coach of the Los Angeles Raiders after Al Davis moved the team to LA. 38-9 victory over the Washington Redskins in Super Bowl 18. Um, he, at the time, 
His two coaching victories ranked only second to the Pittsburgh Steelers, Chuck Noll. Uh, Tom Flores was a Hispanic football trailblazer. Uh, first uh, minority coach ever to win the Super Bowl. First Latino quarterback uh, in football history. First minority general manager in football history with Seattle in 1989. In uh, July, 2011, Flores received the Roberto Clemente Award for Sports Excellence given by the National Council of La Raza for contributions in society, in society, by a Hispanic athlete. Now, uh, his uh, quarterback for one of the Super Bowls was a guy by the name of Jim Plunkett, whose parents were both blind. And the guy who was literally left on the scrap heap after washing out in, with New England Flores on the right there, Plunkett on the uh, left, and Plunkett didn't even want to play. He said, I have enough, I'm getting on out of here. Uh, he's of Mexican descent, first minority quarterback to win the Super Bowl, remains the only Hispanic to be named the Super Bowl MVP. His uh, story has been very, very well documented. Uh, the son of Mexican immigrants who were both blind. He went to Stanford University, excelled as a quarterback, and uh, he was the top selection of the New England Patriots in 1971, but washed out. Didn't really have a productive career up in Foxborough. After five seasons, he spent two years with San Francisco, started 26 games, and didn't really do anything. Another washout. Uh, he joins the Raiders in 1978 as the backup to Ken Stabler. The Raiders traded for Dan Pastorini in 1980, and uh, Dan, who used to be a playboy, in fact, he's far from that today, um, although he had a wild, wild, uh, let's say, dating life while he was with the NFL, in the NFL with Houston and Oakland. Uh, well, Plunkett said, you know what, I'm not going to play, I'm going to retire. Flores said, no, I need you. Come back here. And he did. Uh, he got his chance to play when Pastor Rindley broke his leg in week five of the season. The Raiders went on to become the first wild card team to win the Super Bowl. Plunkett named the MVP. He then led the Raiders to the Super Bowl uh, 18 title after the 1983 season. Tom Fears. Tom Fears is uh, a great player. But Tom Fears did something the National Football League didn't like in another career as uh, an advisor uh, to movies in Hollywood. And he, well, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, he became the first Latino coach in NFL history when he was hired by the New Orleans Saints in 1967. He was the son of a Mexican mother and the father who worked in Mexico but was a U.S. citizen. Uh, the Fierce family moved to Los Angeles when he was six years old. After excelling in college at UCLA, Fierce signed with the Los Angeles Rams. He caught the then NFL record 77 passes for 1,013 yards in 12 games in 1949 and broke that record the next year with 84 catches and 1,116 yards in 1950. But he would make history becoming the first Latino coach with the expansion New Orleans Saints. Uh, and he's also the first Mexican-born player ever to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He washed out as a coach. The Saints were an expansion team. So that's needless to say, they weren't going to win many games. Uh, so he lasted three years there. After one year on the sidelines, he returned as the offensive coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles in 1972, and then as head coach in the uh, World Football League, which only lasted two seasons with the Southern California Sun in Anaheim in 1974. But he was blacklisted from the NFL. The NFL refused to hire him after this. This was a movie called North Dallas 40, written by a player by the name of Peter Gent, who was on the Dallas Cowboys, and he showed off the seedier side of the National Football League in a book called North Dallas 40, and it was sort of like the ball four of football, telling you about a whole bunch of things that the National Football League really didn't want you to know 
But the book was so successful that it became a movie. And they needed somebody to be a technical advisor on the movie to make sure that they were doing the correct things to make it look as real as possible in terms of the film. The Los Angeles-based Fears had a connection to Hollywood, serving as the technical advisor for films. It was in that role, the movie, North Dallas Courtney, that Fears drew the ire of the National Football League, which was not a fan of the film, which showed the tawdry side of the game and its players. And it was based on a book by uh, the Dallas Cowboys wide receiver Peter Jett. Fears never worked in the league again and claimed he was blacklisted. And knowing what I know about the National Football League from hanging around the National Football League for decades, I believe his story, that um, they could be very vindictive if they want to be. Uh, in fact, I know how vindictive they could be. Um, so I believe that story. Pele. Pele was the guy in Brazil. He was such a valuable asset that the country literally kidnapped him to make sure he would never leave to play soccer outside of Brazil for any team uh, except a Brazilian team. Uh, his name was Edson Arantes de Nascimento, and he was born on October 23, 1940. He was named after Thomas Edison. He was named after Thomas Edison, except there was one thing about the name. They didn't know how to spell Edison correctly. They dropped the I. Uh, he's regarded as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, soccer player or football player of all time. He began his football soccer career with uh, Santos in eastern Brazil at the age of 15. He went on to win three World Cup medals in a career that spanned almost two decades. And there he is, a young Pele in the World Cup. He made his international debut. He was 16 years old in 1957. Following a um, year played in his first game in the World Cup Finals in Sweden. Uh, the Brazilian manager didn't really want to play him at first. When he did hit the field, he had an immediate impact, rattling the goalpost with a shot and collecting an assist. Had a hat trick, three goals in the semifinals game against France, two goals in the championship game. Brazil defeated Sweden, and he is a national idol and a national treasure in Brazil. Uh, there he is. Uh, he combined his kicking power and accuracy with a remarkable uh, ability to anticipate other players' moves. Three years after the 1958 World Cup, Pele was declared a national treasure, officially declared the national treasure by the Brazilian government, and um, he, uh, in order to ward off large offers from European clubs and ensure that he would remain in Brazil. Literally, he was a prisoner of the country. He can't play anywhere except for our teams here, which actually led to him being uh, getting a depressed salary. And that is his famous scissors kick. Now, he really didn't do that all that often, just a few times in his career. But the picture looks great, doesn't it? He's vertical to the ground. Um, anyway, he's kicking the ball. Uh, he performed this maneuver in a 1968 match between Brazil and Belgium, and its popularity took off. The bicycle kick is not easy to do. I scored 1,283 goals, and only two or three were bicycle kicks. He wrote in his uh, book, Why Soccer Matters. Well, he's coming to America. Not that he wants to come to America. In fact, that's the last thing he wants to do, is to come to America. Uh, he would much prefer staying in Brazil, but circumstances led him to something else. It was called bankruptcy. He uh -huh. was fleeced. He was absolutely fleeced. Uh, after the, his football career was done in 1974, Pele wanted to lead a quiet, simple life in Brazil, with his wife and two sons. But he was soon forced to rethink his retirement plans, as he recalled himself in his uh, autobiography, The Importance of Football, which was uh, released in 2013. Pele described the moment when he received a surprise visit from his accountant. You didn't want to see a visit like this, or you hope you would never see a visit like this. 
I remember the moment he entered the house as if it was yesterday. He was sweating profusely. He was pale. He looked like he was about to faint. Uh, I could tell something was wrong, so I made a little joke. How many millions have we still got? I nearly had to call the doctor when he replied, look, this is very difficult. Pele was broke and on the brink of bankruptcy. He lost practically every single one of his 41 properties that he had invested in. The properties had been seized by banks after a series of ill-advised investments by at least six companies that had been badly run and the building uh, up debt since the end of the 1960s. He was 33 years old. He was a great athlete, recognized around the world as the greatest soccer player of all time, and he's dead broke. Not only is he broke, he owes people money. The last game ever in Brazil? Hardly. He had to go back to work. Uh, Brussels, uh, Pele was in Brussels with uh, several international stars for a friendly match. He ran into the North American Soccer League's New York Cosmos general manager Clive Toy in the lobby at the GP Motor Inn Hotel. They talked. The Cosmos franchise, which was run by Warners at that time, offered them a contract. $2.8 million, which would be $16.4 million today, took the deal. He needed the money. Uh, and he's coming to America. And he's got to play in Randall's Island. You know where Randall's Island is? Yeah. Okay. Downing Stadium, filled with rats, filled with cockroaches. That is where he is going to play. World-class athlete, an ambassador around the world. He is playing in a stadium filled with vermin, literally filled with vermin. Though well past his prime at this point, Pele is credited uh, with significantly increasing public awareness and the interest of the sport in the United States. He uh, played his first game with the Cosmos on June 15, 1975, against the Dallas Tornado at the old, and decrepit, and small Downing Stadium on Randall's Island. Uh, scoring one goal in the 2-2 drawer. But he comes to America, and in that picture, you might see who is to his left, your right, Mick Jagger. And uh, Adergon, who is uh, the head of Atlantic Records, is there. He is a world-class star. This is the time of Studio 54. Any of you ever went to Studio 54? You went to, can you talk about it? Uh, it was uh, interesting. It was uh, interesting? Yeah, I was there in 1980. Oh, but, well, that was past its prime already. Yeah. It's Star, I mean, Star 54, that was the place to get loaded and to do other things. Uh, Studio 54, which is why it eventually closed. Anyway, uh, they're on tour. The Cosmos become the Rolling Stones in the 1970s. On the road, the Cosmos sold out every game. It was like traveling with the Rolling Stones, said the club's traveling secretary, Steve Marshall. In New York, they were media darlings. It was 77,000 fans who would show up at the Meadowlands, including Mick Jagger and Henry Kissinger. Aside about Kissinger, I was in an elevator with him once. And we started talking. We weren't talking about... Uh, Things like, uh, well, Israel or Egypt. We weren't talking about that at all. I said, do you have any regrets in your life to him? He said, yes. I wanted to be the commissioner of the North American Soccer League. I wanted to make it the biggest thing going. But I was never offered the job. Uh, Robert Redford, Steven Spielberg, and they were always in Studio 54. I was dating a woman uh, at the time, uh, a Pele, and uh, she, he was living in Hackensack, and she brought him to meet my, her, she brought me to meet her father. Not that the relationship was going anywhere, but that's another story for another day. And he says, I got tickets to the Cosmos game, you want to go? I said, I can't, I'm working. And he said, oh, too bad. He said, you'd have a great old time there. Uh, in two years, they became an organization with the cultural visibility that no other arm of the Warner portfolio could boast. 
No movie could equal the cosmos. No record could e uh, equal the cosmos. No cartoon could equal the cosmos. They, they were here, even though they were losing lots and lots and lots of money, but they were up here in uh, the Warner Brothers uh, or Warner portfolio. Uh, it didn't matter that the club never made a single cent in its 15-year history. A home Cosmo game in uh, East Rutherford, New Jersey became the hottest ticket in town. And that was at the time the Yankees uh, were winning World Series and in the World Series in the 1970s. Uh, a footballer meets a footballer. Uh, that is President Gerald Ford uh, and the Cosmos for whatever reason, or at the uh, White House, and uh, Gerald Ford's trying to kick a soccer ball. Gerald Ford's a member of the College Football Hall of Fame, uh, and he was a center with the University of Michigan, and there he is with Pele and some of the people from the Cosmos. Uh, Pele led the Cosmos to the 1977 Soccer Bowl in his third and final season with the club. In June 1977, the Cosmos attracted uh, NASL record 62,364 fans for a 3-0 victory past Tampa Bay with a 37-year-old Pele scoring a hat trick. In the quarterfinals, 77,891 turned out for a Cosmos Fort Lauderdale Strikers game uh, at Giant Stadium. Coming to America. Uh, there he is, Pele. Uh, Pele uh, finished his official career on August 28, 1977 by leading the Cosmos to their second soccer ball title uh, with a 2-1 win over the Seattle Sounders at the Civic Stadium in Portland, Oregon. And he's saying goodbye. This is the goodbye in New Jersey. On October 1st, Pele closed out his career in an exhibition match between the Cosmos and Santos. Uh, the match was played uh, in front of a sold-out crowd at Giant Stadium, televised uh, in the U.S. Uh, on ABC's Wide World of Sports, Jim McKay, uh, as well as throughout the world. Lionel Messi is the number one soccer star in the world right now. Older soccer player is not going to be on top very much longer. He's playing in Major League Soccer. Uh, he, or, the Argentinian. He's probably the best known soccer or football player in the world. Messi was named the uh, world's best player of the year uh, seven times, 2009 to 12, 2015, 2019, 2021. In 2022, he helped Argentina win the World Cup. 2023, he joined the North American-based Major League Soccer League, or Major League Soccer, Signing uh, with the Miami franchise despite being 36 years old and brought attention to the league and the soccer community in the United States. Roberto Clemente. I want to mention this about Roberto Clemente. Get it out of the way right now. Uh, in the stupid cultural wars in the United States, and they are stupid, these cultural wars, but it's always been that case. You go back. 120 years and there were cultural wars. But in Florida, where they banned books, and they banned a lot of books, even though the governor of Florida is a uh, Yale-educated, Harvard-educated lawyer without legacy, he earned his way there. Uh, a book on Roberto Clemente in Jacksonville, Florida, in Duval County, has been taken off the bookshelves. Why? Who knows? But Clemente and Hank Aaron, the baseball hero, baseball yes. heroes, right. baseball stars, their books are not available in me? certain schools and certain libraries in Duval County, Florida. Anyway, Roberto Clemente was born on August the 18th, 1934 in Carolina, Puerto Rico. He excelled in uh, athletics as a youngster and at the age of 17, he was playing for uh, San Terce of the uh, Puerto, Rican League, uh, Puerto Rican Baseball League. He signed with Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, in 1954, he was playing for the AAA team in Montreal. Uh, following the 1954 season, uh, the Dodgers brass decided, you know what, we don't have to protect him. But Branch Rickey knew about him because 
Branch Rickey was running Pittsburgh, and he decided, you know what, I'm going to take him in the Rule 5 draft for $4,000. He paid $4,000, which would be about $47,000 today. During the next five years, Clemente worked to find his stride, battled injuries, he got labeled as a malcontent because he was injured, and a language barrier in America where he was a citizen, but he had no home. He had no home because he was from Puerto Rico. And he played minor league baseball in the American South. It's bad enough for African American players during the Jim Crow era, but it's worse for African Caribbean players who happen to be U.S. citizens who don't know the language. Uh, that is his 1960 baseball card. And if you notice, he is known as Bob Clemente, which he didn't like. His name was Roberto, but he's playing in America, even though he's an American citizen, as Bob Clemente. In 1960, he comes of age as the uh, limber right fielder hits 312, has 94 runs batted in, and he leads the Pirates to the World Series. Clemente hit 310 to help the Pirates defeat the Yankees in seven games. In 1937, the 37-year-old Clemente led the Pirates back to the World Series. He hit 414 to power Pittsburgh to a second title in 11 years, and he was the World Series MVP. He recorded his 3,000th hit late in the 1972 season, 11th player to do so. Uh, Clemente and the Pirates won the National League East, but lost to the Reds in five games in the National League Championship Series. On December 31st, 1972, Clemente boarded a small plane going from Puerto Rico to Niger uh, Nicaragua to assist with earthquake relief. The plane was heavily loaded, crashed just off the Puerto Rican coast. Clemente's body was never found. Uh, that is his Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame plaque. Uh, he went into the Hall of Fame almost immediately. Elected in 1973 in a special election. It didn't have to wait the mandatory five years. He was elected to the Hispanic Heritage Baseball Museum Hall of Fame in 2010. The Caribbean Baseball Hall of Fame in 2015. In 2003, he was inducted into the United States Marine Corps Sports Hall of Fame. And here's a guy who served his country. He was with the Marines uh, in September 1958, uh, served his six-month active duty commitment at Paris Island, South Carolina, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina and Washington, D.C. Uh, Jose Altuve was never going to be a Major League Baseball player. At least that's what the scouts said. And they didn't even know his age. He was, they didn't know, they had no idea. He's from Venezuela, might be the best Hispanic player in the major leagues today or during his era. In uh, 2016, at the age of 16, Altuve attended a Houston Astros tryout camp in uh, America. The team scouts said, uh, nah, you know what, you're not participating. You're too short, and we think you lied about your age. He is the shortest, or uh, was at his time, or during his time, the shortest Major League Baseball player, 5'6", and his weight was listed at 166 pounds. 2017, he won the American League Most Valuable Player Award, the Hank Aaron Award, and won the 2017 World Series with the Houston Astros. Same year, Altuve was Sports Illustrated's co-sports person of the year, with J.J. Watt of the Houston Texans in the National Football League for helping to lead relief efforts in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. Well, watch out for those H hurricanes like Helene, Harvey, they're, they're pretty bad. Uh, Altuve is regarded as one of the greatest Houston Astros players in the franchise history, which dates back to 1962, considered the best second baseman of his generation. Now, Hispanics had an easier time getting to Major League Baseball than African Americans. Why? Because they were lighter skinned. Uh, and that is why they were able to somewhat assimilate into Major League Baseball. Not that they were always welcome, but there was some assimilation. Luis Miguel Castro was born in Medellin, Colombia. According to Major League Baseball, he was the first Latin American on the Major League roster. 
He was an infielder who played 42 games with the Philadelphia Athletics in 1902. Uh, Castro uh, played despite the fact that Major League Baseball and operators of minor league baseball barred non-whites from playing the game on those levels. But they thought he was white, so they allowed him to play on, those, on that level. Minnie Minoso was the first uh, African Caribbean to excel in Major League Baseball. He was from Cuba. Uh, 1949, the uh, Cleveland Indians signed the first black Cuban player, Minnie Minoso. He was first, the first unquestionably black Latin American in the major leagues, although certain Hispanic players with some black blood played uh, in the major leagues before Minnie Minoso. He had two obstacles to overcome, integrating into America's pastime as a black man and doing the same as a foreigner. Many was one of the star players in the 1950s. Many Latin players said that Minnie was uh, the Latin Jackie Robinson. Many showed those players that not only you could make it, but you could become a star. He did a lot to contest the hot-blooded Latin American stereotype of the day. There's one player named Vic Power. He was playing, with the, playing in the New York Yankees farm system. And he had, uh, you know, he had a little touch around first base, have a glove like that, you know, a little panache. The Yankees traded him. He was too flashy. Uh, Hot-tempered, too flashy, that was to describe players who made it to the major leagues and why they shouldn't be in the major leagues at that time. Uh, that was Ray Dandridge, that's his autograph. I interviewed him back in 1984 at the Baseball Hall of Fame. So 84, 87, I forgot which one, it was one of those two years. And he had made it into uh, Baseball's Hall of Fame. And he gave me his card and signed the back of his card for me. And he said um, he had fun playing in Mexico with a lot of other African-American players. Uh, baseball's first, uh, baseball first rose to prominence in the 1880s in Mexico and now ranks among Mexico's most popular sports. Sources claim that baseball reached Mexican soil because of U.S. military forces that participated in the U.S.-Mexican War between 1846 and 1848. In the 1930s, when African-American players were barred from playing in any organized league connected with Major League Baseball in America, although there were Negro leagues, African-American players were welcomed with open arms in Mexico. Satchel Page, cool Papa Bell, left the Negro League, along with many others to play in Mexico. Following World War II, there was an attempt to start a Mexican version of Major League Baseball. Bob Feller, who is a great pitcher for the Cleveland Indians in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, happened to know him, happened to interview him. Uh, strange guy, strange guy, I'm not going to get into his strangeness now, but he was, he was pretty forthcoming with stories. Uh, Jorge Pascal uh, ended up with uh, the club uh, in Veracruz. He signed Satchel Page in 1938. He also added three players who would be eventually enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, Josh Gibson, Ray Dandridge, who I just spoke about, and Monty Irvin. Uh, and there is Pascal. He is uh, there with uh, his kids. He's got the mustache uh, in a dugout. Uh, he took many of the Negro League's best players, and by 1946, he was rating Major League Baseball. Uh, he was the league president, he used suitcases filled with money to lure nearly two dozen white American players south, where they played alongside Negro stars, uh, banned from Major Leagues because of the color of their skin. Uh, 1946, Pasquale's league became the first in professional baseball to fully integrate. 1946 is the year that Jackie Robinson played in Montreal, minor league baseball. And major league players went to Mexico, like Vern Jr. Stevens uh, of St. Louis, and Sal Magley, and Max Lanier, and Mickey Owen. Uh, the Pasquale brothers made a run at Phil Rizzuto and Ted Williams. Ted Williams' mother was Mexican. Uh, Feller and Stan Musial, but ultimately the plan collapsed. Stevens signed a five-year contract with the Mexican League in 1946. He had been in Mexico only a few days when his father, a minor league umpire, and the St. Louis Browns scout, Jack Fournier, 
drove down and brought them back to the United States. Lanier, that's Max Lanier, and others were suspended. Uh, all the players who went to Mexico were suspended by organized baseball, by the commissioner, Happy Chandler, for five years. Now, he really couldn't do that. I mean, and these guys knew it, and he knew it. Happy Chandler was a politician in the war. He knew he couldn't do it. Uh, Lanier and Fred Martin filed suit in federal court maintaining that baseball had violated antitrust laws by depriving them of their livelihood. Um, Major League Baseball got an antitrust exemption from the United States Supreme Court in 1922. And I'm not going to get into the mechanics of that, but they never should have gotten the antitrust suit except one of the justices had ties to Major League Baseball and Kennesaw Mountain Landis was a judge that uh, became baseball commissioner and it's all entangled and twined in that nonsense. But anyway, Danny Gardello, a former New York Giants outfielder who also went to Mexico, filed a similar lawsuit. Faced with the challenge of baseball's contract structure, Chandler lifted the suspensions in June 1949. The lawsuits were dropped because you know what? Major League Baseball loves its antitrust exem exemption, especially them. And they knew that it would come crumbling if these cases ever went to court. So let's settle. We'll get it out of the way. And yeah, we we'll keep that antitrust exemption. I know too much about how baseball operates. Uh, Mickey Owen, Babe Ruth, and uh, Jorge Pasquale. Uh, Feller, they wanted the players who jumped to Mexico back here. Pasquale down there, he was a dictator. He and his four brothers ran the country. George Pasquale, I knew him quite well. Uh, I played ball for him in 1947. They were barnstorming against teams in Mexico. Uh, so Happy Chandler and Larry McPhail figured out they had to give the players a pension plan and get the players back. Uh, they gave the players who jumped to Mexico amnesty. Uh, and this is uh, the Trujillo team uh, back in 1937 uh, with Pasquale there. Satchel Page's All-Stars. Uh, by far the biggest draw of the barnstorming teams. Page would often tour with Bob Feller's All-Stars or Dizzy Dean's All-Stars. Feller always considered himself the greatest pitcher ever in baseball, but he allowed Satchel Page to be on that level. Why? Satchel taught him how to make money. Uh, games featuring Satchel Page's team versus Bob Feller's Major League All-Star team would play the sold-out Major League and Minor League stadiums in the offseason all over the United States and Mexico. Satchel Page had such a presence in barnstorming baseball that he even had his own private airplane to fly his team from game to game. He knew how to make money. The Mexican League was uh, recognized officially by Major League Baseball organized baseball as an official minor league in 1955 with a double A status. It was elevated to triple A status in 1968, but none of its teams are affiliated with Major League teams. Uh, Mexican League has 20 teams. There is a winter Mexican baseball league with 10 teams. Major League Baseball has played games in Mexico City and Monterrey. Roy Campanella. Uh, more than 100 Mexicans have played uh, Major League Baseball. Roy Campanella and Monty Urban are both in Cooperstown and Mexican Baseball Hall of Famers. Mel uh, Amada was the first uh, Mexican player ever in Major League Baseball, born in Sonora. Uh, he hit the Major Leagues in 1933. It's a career that lasted seven seasons. He played for the Boston Red Sox, Washington Senators, St. Louis Browns, and Brooklyn Dodgers. Pretty good play. Hit 284, 15 home runs, 360 runs batted in. He's in the Mexican Baseball Hall of Fame and was inducted in 1971. I tell my wife, whatever you do at this party, whatever you do, do not mention Fidel Castro to Jose. We'll be there all night. Well, I'll tell you about Jose. Jose is a Cuban, was a Cuban baseball player. Played with Washington in Minnesota. Ended up here in New York doing sports for Channel 47, WNJU, lived in New Jersey, which is now part of NBC. But he was doing uh, sports in the 1970s and 1980s. He was Cuban. 
And I want to ask you, how good a player was Fidel Castro? Fidel Castro? And what's this uh, here that Fidel Castro could have played in Major League Baseball? Kind of laugh. Say it was terrible. Say he couldn't play. Now, back in those days, Major League Baseball had one scout, a guy by the name of Joe Cambria. He was with Washington. Washington didn't have any money. Never had any money. They would sign Cuban players for pennies on the dollar. And they would have these tryouts. And Jose Valdiviso said, if you had a ball, rather a glove and a bat, you got a tryout if you were a guy. Uh, Clark Griffith's Washington Senators franchise signed Cuban players. The players were good, but more importantly, they were cheap. And Joe Cambria found good players. Cambria and Griffith led the way in bringing Cuban players to Major League Baseball. Uh, during the 1940s and the 1950s. Of the 51 Cuban-born players to make their major league debuts between 1935 and 1956, 32 of them did so with the Washington Senators baseball team. Uh, before Robert Estalia uh, debuted with the Senators on September 5, 1935, 19 Cubans played in the major leagues, since 1871. And remember, Cuba was the territory of the United States between 1898 and 1902. Cambria was credited as signing as many as 400 Cubans for Washington. Cambria got their signatures on contracts at rock bottom prices. He missed on this guy, Tony Perez, who is in the Baseball Hall of Fame, Cincinnati. Esteban Bella uh, was the first Latin born professional baseball player uh, playing with the National Association's Troy Haymakers in the New York Mutuals between 1871 and 1873. The golden age of Cubans in the major leagues with Minnie Minoso in 1949, followed uh, by Tony Oliva, Leo Chico Cardenas, and Mike Cuellar, and Cookie Rojas, Tony Gonzalez, and Tony Taylor, and Tony Perez, and Zoilio Versailles. Shortly after the 1959 revolution in Cuba, professional baseball was outlawed in the country and replaced with amateurism. Cuban baseball, Cubans, baseball club, the Havana Sugar Kings uh, International League. Organized baseball relocated the International League's Havana Sugar Kings to Jersey City, New Jersey, on June 8, 1960, after Fidel Castro uh, nationalized all businesses. President Dwight Eisenhower's administration or, uh, pressured organized baseball to leave Cuba. President John Kennedy's administration imposed a trade embargo on Cuba in 1962, which saw a number of Cuban baseball players defect to the United States. Well, getting back to Valdiviso. Uh, Valdiviso said Castro did have a tryout, like everybody else, and he was terrible. There was no way he was ever going to get a Major League Baseball contract. As far as Valdiviso, he was unable to go back to Cuba. Never saw his family again and was very bitter. Hated Castro. Absolutely hated Castro. Which is why I told my wife, whatever you do, do not mention Fidel Castro. We'll be there all night. Well, she did. She was there all night listening to uh, Jose talking about Fidel. 1999, the Cuban national baseball team played the two-game exhibition series against the Baltimore Orioles in Major League Baseball. This marked the first time the Cuban national team played against the Major League Baseball team and the first time a Major League Baseball team played in Cuba since 1959. In uh, 2018, Major League Baseball reached an agreement with the Cuban Baseball Federation allowing Cuban players to sign with U.S. teams without needing to defect, uh, seeking to end the practice of uh, Cuban stars being smuggled off the islands on speedboats and just pack them into a speedboat, hide them in there with whatever they had. Uh, President Donald Trump's administration voided the deal in April 2019. Uh, Cuban players started to defect again, and that's where we stand right now. Now, this guy might have beaten Muhammad Ali or might have beaten George Foreman, or might have beaten uh, Joe Frazier. Uh, Teofilo Stevenson, 
Uh, he was the first boxer to win a gold medal in the same division three times uh, in the Olympics, uh, competing in what is now known as the super heavyweight division. Stevenson began his Olympic career at the 1972 Munich Games and won a gold medal. He, was a gold, he won the gold medal at the 1976 Montreal Olympics, and there was talk, Let, ma let's match him up against Muhammad Ali. This would be a great fight, make millions of dollars, pay-per-view, closed circuit, whatever it was. Wouldn't be pay-per-view in those days, it'd be closed circuit TV. We'll do it. Ali was willing. There were reports that Stevens was offered millions of dollars to fight in the United States. But the Castro government banned Cubans from competing professionally, so he would have to defect to take on Ali. 1974. No, I will not leave my country for one million dollars or for as much more than that. He was quoted in Sports Illustrated in 1974. Dominican players, the Alou brothers, don't really look like brothers, but they're brothers. Felipe on the right, Matty in the middle, and uh, Jesus uh, on the left. Vin Scully had a big problem with um, Jesus Alou. He was a religious Catholic, and he used to call Jesus Alou J. Alou because he didn't want to offend Jesus Christ. Uh, Dominican uh, Republic players uh, made the major leagues in the 1950s. Ozzie Virgil, who recently passed away, an infielder with the New York Giants, was the first Dominican in the major starting in 1956, followed by Felipe Alou in 1958, same team, different city, San Francisco. The first Dominican star, the pitcher Juan Marichal, made his debut in 1960, also with the Giants. Uh, Lou's two brothers, Mateo and Jesus, played with the uh, Giants. Uh, on uh, September 15, 1963, the three Alou brothers played together in the outfield in a game against Pittsburgh, a baseball first. Uh, Fernando Valenzuela, Fernando Mania, he just passed away a couple days ago. Uh, it started on April 9, 1981. He debuted with the Dodgers in 1980, excelled in 1981. 1981 was the strike's shortened season. He became the first player ever to win the Rookie of the Year and Cy Young Awards the same year. His team won the World Series. He became a cultural icon in both Los Angeles and in his native Mexico. Eleven of uh, Fernando's 12 starts at Dodger Stadium in 1981 were sellouts. On the road during his first two years, his starts drew 13,000 more people than other Dodgers starters. And there is Valenzuela. He became the most important Mexican player in Major League Baseball history. Only Bobby Avila with the uh, American League Cleveland Indians won the batting title uh, in 1954 was notable. Fernando turned so many people from Mexico, Central America, and South America into fans. He created interest in baseball among people who did not care for baseball. He pitched 11 years for Los Angeles. His first few years with the team, he was the biggest attraction in baseball in the 1980s. Oh, wait, Pancho Villa. He's not a sports guy, is he? Well, actually, he is. Pancho Villa, 1914, Pancho Villa. Uh, wished to add to his war chest. And he wanted to stage a world title uh, championship uh, event at Cunadad Juarez between Jack Jackson, uh, Jack Johnson, and Jess Wilbur. Johnson, the first African American heavyweight champion, lived in self exile after a racially motivated jury convicted him of violating the Mann Act, which was basically written to make sure Jack Johnson would go to jail and not be the heavyweight champion of the world. The Mann Act says, if you're a guy and you take a girl across state lines for moral purposes, you could be arrested. And I lived on the border of New York and New Jersey, and I can tell you how many friends should have ended up in, well, I shouldn't tell you that, should I? <laughs> how many could have ended up in jail? <laughs> Gee, I wonder what number they would have given me. Anyway. Uh, because of the conviction, Johnson could not travel to the Mexican border town uh, through the United States, and he was also worried that it was too close to the U.S. border that they would nab him. Uh, because Diaz Fo, uh, the uh, uh, head of uh, the Vinastano uh, Carranza, controlled the Mexican uh, coastlines, promoters moved the fight 
uh, from Juarez to Cuba. During his exile, Johnson lived and boxed across Latin America until the Mexican government welcomed him as a guest in 1919. Uh, Johnson lived in Mexico and until 1920 when uh, the revolutionary violence forced him to surrender to U.S. authorities. Uh, the boxers. This is actually in my living room. This is uh, all these old pugs signed this poster for me, including this one. It says Muhammad Ali right there. Uh, by the 1960s, the influence of Mexican boxers not only expanded into the United States, but also globally. In the latter months of 1963, representatives intent on reforming and unifying the sport from Latin America, Asia, Europe, and the United States attended a boxing convention in Mexico City. Out of this convention came the World Boxing Council, boxing's first global sanctioning body. Some of the uh, fighters from Mexico included Julio Cesar Chavez. Um, uh, he's a uh, mechizo. Uh, this is a macho man. So-called uh, Mexican-style boxing emphasizes offensive uh, uh, aggression while paying only minimal attention to defense. It didn't originate with him, but it's associated with him, and he's a Mexican hero. V.S., the uh, tennis champion uh, from Argentina, uh, one of the greatest players of all time during the 1970s. He was playing against and defeating Bjorn Borg, Jimmy Connors, Ely Nastassi, Arthur Ashe. Uh, he won the 1977 U.S. Open in uh, Queens. Uh, one of the most popular players on the tour. 62 ATP championships, four major titles, Australian Open 1978-79, French and U.S. Opens in 1977. He retired in 1989 and was inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame in 1991. Uh, Maria Bueno, uh, one of Latin America's most successful <coughs> tennis players. She was once the top player in the world. 19 Grand Slam titles, including three Wimbledon crowns. Dominant player from 58 to 68. She once claimed that she was a totally instinctive player. The moment I have to think about tennis, I cannot play. It's like Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra said, I can't hit the thing at the same time. Uh, in 2015, the Brazilian Olympics tennis stadium was named after her. Mexico City, the uh, protest by Tommy Smith and John Carlos Smith in the middle, Carlos on the right. Uh, Dr. Tommy Smith originally advocated a boycott of the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games. His reasons, well, get South Africa and Rhodesia uninvited from the Olympics, give Muhammad Ali back his world boxing title, get rid of Avery Brundage, the racist anti-Semite, uh, as the president of the IOC International Olympic Committee, and hire more African-American assistant coaches. Protests followed the 10-meter race, that has something that the two had been planning. Uh, as gold medal winner Smith, and the bronze medal winner Carlos walked to the podium. They took off their shoes to protest poverty. They wore beads and the scarves uh, to protest lynching. Uh, and when the national anthem was played, they lowered their heads in defiance and raised their fists in a black power salute. And that is the salute. I don't like the idea of people looking at it as a negative. Dr. Smith, who is a college professor, said uh, he uh, also, my cousin, who uh, is a bankruptcy lawyer, went to Oberlin, where he taught, and they're still in contact. He was on Smith's track and field team. There was nothing, uh, nothing but a raised fist in the air and a bowed head, acknowledging the American flag, not symbolizing the hatred for it. Carlos, who worked as a guidance counselor at Palm Springs High School in California, told the Guardian newspaper, I had a moral obligation to step up. Morality was a far greater force than the rules and regulations they had. On his left breast, the Australian uh, Peter Norman wore a small badge, red, Olympic Project for Human Rights, an organization set up a year previously to oppose racism in sports. Norman suggested that Carlos and Smith split their gloves. Uh, Norman asked a member of the United States uh, rowing team, uh, if uh, a badge that if he could borrow a badge that read Olympic Project for Human Rights, 
Norman was criticized for siding with the two Americans protesting by his people in the, uh, his homeland of uh, Austria and became a non-citizen, literally. Tommy Smith played football for the American Football League Cincinnati Bengals. There was no teeth gnashing when he did it in 1969 as opposed to Colin Kaepernick a few years ago. Smith and Carlos played in the AFL and the NFL. Smith one season with Paul Brown, Cincinnati Bengals. Carlos, one year with the Philadelphia Eagles, one year in the Canadian Football League. Smith and Carlos kept their medals. And they were never asked to return them to the International Olympic Committee. And Mary Max, Lee Trevino, won six uh, straight golf championships, including two U.S. titles and consecutive triumphs at both the Open Championship, which is in Britain, and the uh, PGA Championship. He was known for his unconventional swing and his charismatic personality. The Mary Max was a fan favorite throughout his illustrious career. Nancy Lopez was a great golfer, probably the most accomplished Latina golfer of all time. She won 48 LPGA championships, including three major championships. Carl, uh, Carmelo Anthony is probably the most decorated uh, Puerto Rican basketball player. Uh, rather, Hispanic basketball player is considered by some to be the greatest Latino basketball player of all time. Ten NBA All-Star games, never won an NBA championship. Parts, uh, he was part of three American gold winning Olympic teams, uh, along with the uh, American group that won the bronze medal. Member of the University of Syracuse's uh, NCAA National Championship in 2003. Pal Gasol. He is from Spain. Uh, he is the most uh, accomplished Spanish player in the NBA, part of the Spanish national teams that rivaled Team USA at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, 2012 London Olympics, 2016 Rio de Janeiro Olympics. He was on a Spanish squad that won two silver medals and a bronze medal. In the NBA, he had uh, nearly 21,000 points, 11,000 rebounds. Rebecca Lobo, uh, one of the early stars of the Women's National Basketball Association, Cuban-American, part of the uh, NCAA's Women's National Championship squad with the University of Connecticut in 1995. She and her American teammates won gold medals at the 1996 Atlantic Games, and she became a member of the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame 2017. Dana Torres, uh, one of the most successful Olympic Olympians of all time. She won 12 total medals, 2008, at the age of 41. She became the oldest swimmer to make a U.S. Olympic team. First swimmer to represent the U.S. Uh, in five Olympics, 84, 88, 1992, 2000, 2008. She was a model. First elite swimmer to model swimwear, a Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. Perry in 1994, member of the Jewish International Sports Hall of Fame. That happened in 2005. Austin Matthews is a player with the Toronto Maple Leafs. His mother is Mexican. He's the greatest Latino talent ever to play in the National Hockey League. Bill Garrett grew up in uh, Willow Abram, Massachusetts, had an all-star career playing for eight teams over 20 years. He was the NHL's first Latino player. Made his debut February 20th, 1992. After his retirement, he became an NHL executive. His mother, Legere, grew up in Nicaragua, moved to the United States, and attended the University of Mississippi. Scott Gomez uh, grew up in Anchorage. Uh, he was the target of uh, racial slurs because of the rarity of the com uh, his culture in the sport. One of his most vivid events was when a player called Scott he spit during a playoff game. At first, he didn't know what it meant, so he asked his mother, and she told him. He was good, really, really good. The 18-year-old Scotty Gomez was drafted by the Devils, New Jersey Devils, as the first choice in 1998, the first Latino ever to be drafted in the first round of the NHL draft. Uh, he was the first Mexican-American to play in the NHL. He also appeared on the NBC TV soap opera Days of Our Lives in a small role. In his rookie year, he had 51 assists and 70 points. He was the rookie of the year. He, was on, in the, uh, he played in the NHL All-Star game. 
scored 10 points in the 2000 NHL playoffs since the Devils won their second Stanley Cup. Next stop is Mexico City. Uh, NBA has played games in Mexico since 1992. The league has uh, listed Mexico City uh, as a place of interest that could lead to uh, placing a team in Mexico City. Major League Baseball has viewed Mexico City as a place where a franchise could be established. Uh, Football America, uh, NFL took a break from Mexico City over the last couple of years because of the stadium uh, rebuild in Mexico City. The NFL promotes its product heavily in Mexico. National Hockey League is exploring the possibility of playing a regular season game in Mexico. The World Cup, soccer, coming to North America. Uh, in 2017, the United 2026 bid, a joint effort to share FIFA's World Cup men's tournament, three ways between the US, Mexico, and Canada, defeated the proposal from Morocco to win the right to host FIFA's International Soccer Showcase. That will be the next time a Hispanic country will be in a global spotlight for major sports tournaments. Any questions, any comments? It is your turn to talk.